Okie dokie, let's do this. Hello everybody, can you hear me? How is the um, transmission? Am I audible? Excellent, loud and clear, hopefully not too loud today. Um, welcome to another webinar by Myron Sound. Um, today is the first a la carte on demand webinar, which means that uh, you got to choose from uh, three topics and um, and you ended up choosing uh, power scaling through the poll that lived on the Meyer Sound uh, user community Facebook group. Excellent. So, as always, um, let's begin with um, looking at the um, Zoom video conference platform that we're using um, for these webinars, which means that I'm going to share my screen. Uh, my camera is turned on. I press record. My microphone is unmuted. Uh, what else can go wrong? Very little, hopefully. Okay, so um, let me start sharing my screen and um, let's have a look at the keynote. So, like I said before, um, we have three options on the menu power scaling, M noise, and Roskilde the Festival. Uh, you ended up choosing uh, power scaling, and that means that today's focus will be that very topic uh, power scaling. Uh, but before we start looking at power scaling, um, let's briefly rehearse uh, the Zoom platform. So in front of you, you're expected to have a window, not unlike the one you see over here. Um, if you want to see who else is joining you on the call, all that's left to do is uh, click on participants, which will open a dialogue on the right hand side showing a list of uh, participants. Um, we encourage you to ask questions, but in order to do so, please make use of the raise hand feature shown by the gray button over here at the bottom of that window. If you click that button, uh, a blue hand will pop up in my screen informing me that you would like to ask a question, at which point I will try to find a white space in my narrative and then I will attempt to answer the, um, then I will attempt to answer the um, question to the best of my abilities. Now I'm shortly making a note um, because somebody in the chat is saying, can you do a webinar on the same platform? So I'm just, you know, making a mental note of that. Um, if you raise your hand and you would like to ask a question, uh, please use the chat function to do so. So if you click on that chat balloon icon at the bottom of this window, <coughs> right hand pane will split in half. Bottom section now allows you to chat. Uh, there is a, a box at the bottom, pretty self-explanatory, where you can enter a, a message and address the nation, everyone. Um, but if you happen to see a fellow colleague, family member or friend in the list of attendees, you can also select that person and send him or her that message uh, privately. So please use the raise hand feature. That way I know that you're about to ask a question. Okay, uh, that concludes uh, household notes, which means that uh, those that are joining us through Facebook Live, welcome. Uh, you are watching at our stream in the Meyer Sound users community, which is currently counting over 8,000 members. Welcome to those people as well. Um, of course, this recording will be available upon conclusion on our YouTube channel, Thinking Sound, which I will also emphasize once more at the end of today's session. Okay, so um, everything we've been doing for the past couple of weeks is all, uh, is, all, uh, is all to show you our workflow, which is the Precision Toolset, which is a turnkey solution that allows us to design and monitor sound systems and, and, and distribute those sound systems, uh, deploy those sound systems with a turnkey uh, solution. So we've already looked at Map, we've already looked at Galaxy, um, we've had our first case study using ultra series loudspeakers such as the X40 and the X20. Uh, all of that can be found on the YouTube Thinking Sound channel. And today uh, you chose, uh, you, you, expressed your, uh, you expressed your preference for us to talk about power scaling, which means that as always, I made a list. I have my pen ready to make sure that I don't skip any topics. And we're gonna talk about power scaling which uh, deals with decibels and ratios. Um, we're going to look at a subset of all Meyer Sound loudspeakers. We're going to look at various fill systems and how to design those fill systems with emphasis on power scaling. Because what is power scaling? 
Power scaling is finding a suitable companion loudspeaker whose job description is that of a fill loudspeaker, which could be a front fill, could be an outfill, could be an infill, uh, could be a center fill, over balcony, under balcony, but it's finding the suitable companion to a main loudspeaker. So if your main loudspeaker happens to be Leopard, what is the ideal companion for a front fill or the ideal companion for an under balcony? Um, because we want a loudspeaker that is not overpowered and we don't want a loudspeaker that is underpowered for that particular uh, job description, for that fill duty, if you will. We want a loudspeaker that is a perfect match to be companion to that uh, main PA loudspeaker. And that's what power scaling is all about. It's about finding the proper companion to a main loudspeaker. And that has all to do with ratios and decibels. There is there is no escaping it. So let's you know dive up the deep end. A decibel is nothing else but a ratio or a fraction or a factor or percentage, which is four ways of saying the same thing. It's a ratio, fraction, factor, percentage, percentage expressed on a logarithmic scale. That's it. It's two sides of the same coin. One side of the coin is the linear scale, like a ruler, which everybody feels comfortable with. And the other side of the coin is decibels. Unfortunately, decibels is the unit that you and I deal with when we're talking about loudness and level. So we better get used to that. But it's a simple ratio. It's a ratio be between two quantities, a factor percentage uh, or a uh, fraction. So uh, most of you are familiar with uh, several uh, key values. We know, for example, that if we uh, double our voltage or double our pressure, that that constitutes a 6 dB increase. Uh, the same is true when we double once more. If we quadruple our voltage or quadruple our pressure, then we gain another 6 decibels. We make a jump from plus 6 to plus 12 decibels. And if we double up once more by going from a factor 4 to a factor 8, we gain another 6 decibels. Um, everybody is expected to be familiar with this. Uh, mind you, this applies to volts and pressure, which is 99% of the time are the units uh, that we're dealing with. The same is true if we go in the other direction. If I have a quantity, if I have a certain voltage, or if I have a certain pressure, then we lose six decibels. And uh, if we do so once more, leaving us with 25% or one fourth, whatever floats your boat, then we lose another six decibels. And if we divide by two once more, which leaves us with one eighth or 12 and a half percent, then we're down by 18 decibels. And you know, those are big steps. These are six to be jumps, if you will. Um, some people might also know uh, other increments. Uh, they might know that if you multiply by 10, which is a 1000% increase, if you multiply by 10, that you gain 20 decibels. Um, whereas you divide by 10, 1 tenth, leaving you only with 10% of the volts or 10% of the pascals or pressure, then you go down in level um, by 20 decibels. And here you see very common values. Uh, interestingly enough, all of this can be calculated on the back of an envelope, but we'll save that for another day. So this is, this is crucial to, to, to what we're about to discuss, which is that decibel is nothing but a ratio, fraction, factor, or percentage. So, um, Meyer Sound makes many loudspeakers. We have a, a, a huge portfolio, and over here we just have a subset of all loudspeakers that you will find in the Meyer Sound portfolio. Uh, the most powerful one is our flagship loudspeaker, which would be the Leo uh, line array element, curvilinear line array element um, from the Leo family uh, product range. Um, and all these loudspeakers have been grouped in 3 dB chunks, if you will. So if you go from Leo to Lion M, you go down in level by roughly three decibels. And if you go from Lion M to Lion W, you go approximately down in level from, uh, from, from Lion M to Lion W, you go down by approximately three decibels. It's not an exact science. These are groups of roughly three dB uh, chunks. If we go from Lion W to Leopard, it's another three dB step. And if we go from Leopard to Lina, it's another three dB step or Lina. 
And if we go from Lina to Mina, it's another 3DB step, and ultimately UP Junior, UPM, UP4 XP, which is arguably the smallest loudspeaker that we make. And they have been grouped in 3DB chunks, if you will. Um, however, we also know that 3 decibels equals a factor of 1.4 uh, for those that were paying attention to the um, previous slide. 1.4 also happens to know happens to be the square root of 2 and um, if you uh, multiply the square root of 2 by the square root of 2 you're going to get a factor of 2 which is another 3 dB increase and if you multiply 2 by 1.4 you gain another 3 decibels and if you multiply 2.8 by 1.4 you gain another 3 decibels and if you multiply 4 by 1.4 you gain another 3 decibels and every time you multiply by 1.4, a factor of 1.4, you gain another 3 decibels. So those 3 dB chunks, those 3 dB chunks represent 1.4 times increments. Every time you increase a value, whether it's distance, volts, or, or, or pressure, every time you multiply by a factor of 1.4, that's going to be a 3 dB step. So that's the idea behind this chart. And in a while we're going to see how to apply this chart. Because what kind of fill systems are there? Well, I already mentioned several ones during the introduction. There are side fills, out fills, down fills, rear fills, center fills, in fills, and front fills. And then you have your, you know, you could you could even add to this your over balconies and under balconies, which are basically uh, variations to the uh, to the theme okay <clears throat> so those kind of fill systems uh, are very common their support acts for minorities of the audience as we're about to discover any sensible design starts with covering as many people in one go leaving local areas that are underexposed which hopefully are minorities and they get dedicated fill systems out of these uh, different categories that we have over here so how does the fill system design process uh, take place? It starts by evaluating which areas are underexposed, which areas are not covered by the mains, which people are not in the custody of the main PA. Now, hopefully that constitutes a minority. So once we've evaluated which people are underexposed, we can now start thinking about what kind of fill system would be appropriate to cater those people, that minority. In the first two rows, it's probably going to be a uh, it's, it's probably going to be a front fill system. But the people that are sitting next to the stage and are looking in Ed Sheeran's ears rather than his eyes, they're going to need an outfill, and so on and so forth. And then we get to the uh, essence of today's webinars, which is once I've uh, committed myself to a particular fill system, whether it's infill, outfill, center fill, or front fill, now I need to find the right loudspeaker. It needs to be skilled proportionally so that we don't end up having a bazooka in the first row that blows off somebody's head. We want the proper companion loudspeaker to complement that main speaker. And how are we going to find out which loudspeaker is the right candidate uh, for that particular uh, job description? And then finally, maybe you need more quantities and how to space and splay them, but that's beyond the scope of this particular webinar. And um, the same goes for evaluating any processing needs. Uh, the, the, the mission critical concepts are evaluate the areas that are underexposed and find the proper companion loudspeaker. That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, over here, we see a plan view from a arena sized event um, using Leo. Um, we see left, right arrays in plan view big chunk of the audience is covered but as I said people that are looking in at Sharon's ears and not in their eyes they are underexposed so now the question becomes what kind of element do I need as an outfill as a companion uh, as an outfill system to complement that uh, Leo main system because it's clear that that area is underexposed and um, and we need to come up with the proper companion because those people are not living at 70 meters distance as in 70 those people are living only at 40 meters distance and the question then becomes do I really need a Leo element 
over there when I'm al almost, not yet, but almost two times closer? Do I still need a Leo element or do I, can I afford a smaller loudspeaker, uh, a, a, a proper companion to that uh, main PA? The same is true for that um, area in front of the stage. It's pretty clear that front fills um, are mandatory uh, in, in, in that region. But once the front fills are in place, it remains to be seen whether a, a center fill might be uh, required in that particular application. Um, so again, what will be the proper companion for those different um, minorities within the audience? Well, that's what power scaling is all about. The process is a, a two-step process. It starts by determining what is my main speaker model as a reference, regardless of the quantity. So if, 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 if Leo happens to be the main PA, I don't care whether it's 12 underneath each other or 16 underneath each other, uh, Leo will be the reference. Whereas if Lion is the reference, regardless of the number of quantities, then if that Lion happens to be the main speaker, then that's going to be the reference. So that's the big guns, so to speak. And then the next step is going to be what is the range ratio? What is the custodial arrangement between that main speaker and the fill loudspeaker that is intended to cover that minority of the audience. And the decisive parameter will be the so-called range ratio, which is uh, something that we already discussed during previous webinars, uh, such as the webinar uh, earlier this week where we did a case study of ultra series. So range ratio keeps showing up as a crucial concept in all these uh, design dilemmas. So um, let's do a simple uh, mathematical uh, thought experiment. Imagine that we have a main speaker that travels 20, 20 meters to its destination. Um, could be the first row. And we're going to see um, in-depth examples of this, but just for the sake of, of, of warming up, a main speaker that travels 20 meters to its destination, whereas a fill speaker that only has to travel two meters to that same point in space. For all you know, there's two meters between the first row and the edge of the stage, whereas 20 meters uh, between that same first row and the bottom element in a, in a line array in the main system. Unlikely range ratio, but just as a warm-up exercise. Well, then we're dealing with a ratio of 10 to 1, where 20 meters is 10 times more distant than 2 meters. And in decibels, that becomes a 20 dB difference which means that I can get away with a front fill loudspeaker that is 20 decibels less powerful than the main PA because the loudspeaker is also 10 times physically closer. That's the entire concept of finding the proper companion loudspeaker. So I want to look, uh, look at that a little bit more in depth in, in MAP. And uh, today I thought, uh, you know, I'm a little bit nostalgic. So I thought, why don't we use a UPA 1P? which has been chosen to give a desired level at, let's say, 28 meters, and compare that UPA main speaker from here on to uh, three uh, potential companion loudspeakers, which could be the UPJ 1P, UPA Junior, or UPM 1P. And then we will discover that those loudspeakers, unlike that UPA, which makes it all the way to 28 meters, that's how it's been designed, that's why it's been chosen, because it achieves a desired level at 28 meters, then we will discover that those less powerful loudspeakers, such as the UPJ 1P U Junior and, and the UPM 1P, that they won't make it all the way there because these loudspeakers are less powerful out of the gate to begin with. And this is the very thing that I would like to investigate. Now, before we're going to look at those slides, I first uh, want to um, familiarize you once more with MAP and how MAP behaves in this regard. So, let me clear this and, and show you uh, what we have over here. So, here we have plan view, we have a prediction plane, and the area of interest is 70, that is 70 meters wide. So, uh, this dimension, this dimension, is 70 meters, 70, whereas the depth of today's prediction plane is 28 meters. So from the line where the loudspeakers live to the top of the prediction plane or sound field, that is today is 28 meters. The only reason that I gave you uh, five meters behind the loudspeakers is just a little bit of, of, of extra square meters for you to see. Um, just a little bit of, of air behind the loudspeakers. But the main 
area that I'm concerned about is that 70 meters wide by 28 meter uh, deep um, plan view that we're currently looking at. And in our plan view, we have two loudspeakers. There's a UPA living over here, which is our main PA today in this uh, particular exercise. And we have a UPJ 1P, which is today's fill loudspeaker. And the only reason that they're separated this far away from each other, the only reason that they're separated this far away from each other, because I don't want to see the cross-pollination, the interference of the UPJ-1P in the territory of the UPA or the interference of the UPA in the territory of the UPJ-1P. So they're only like little children. They have been separated from each other because I don't want to see the interaction in each other's uh, territory. So let's look at a prediction starting with our UPA first. I'm going to select our UPA. Um, select our UPA and let's uh, look at a picture. So the UPA is the loudest loudspeaker um, on the sound field. Anyone that is familiar with our portfolio knows that a UPA is louder than a UPJ. And this was the thing with scales in MAP that we need to uh, remind of us constantly. Now what do I mean by scale? I'm talking about the SPL scale uh, specifically. This scale which goes from zero at the top to negative 42 uh, at the bottom, that maximum value, that maximum value which you can think of, uh, of you can think of that as full skill, that maximum value is determined by the loudest position in the sound field. Because in MAP we look at attenuation, we do not look at absolute SPL values anywhere within the sound field. For that we have the measurement viewer which allows you to look at actual transfer functions and band spectra showing you headroom and SPL figures. In the sound field we see only attenuation and uh, that attenuation obeys the inverse square law which states that if you double your distance you lose six decibels. So as you increase your distance to a loudspeaker the direct sound loses market share at a 6 dB per doubling distance rate. So the loudest loudspeaker in the sound field determines, determines the maximum value of the SPL uh, chart that we see on the right hand side. And that is of course in this case that is going to be the value that we see over here at one meter distance on access to the loudspeaker. That value sets where full scale lives. So it's the loudest loudspeaker in the sound field that sets full skill. Okay, other than that, we see that you know every time we double our distance, we lose six decibels. It's all in there uh, if you know what to look for. Okay, now I want to see my UPA and my UPJ side by side. And that means that I want to see both loudspeakers side by side. Now, Here's the thing that I'm trying to get across, okay? Of these two loudspeakers, the UPA on the left side is the big gun. That is the loudest loudspeaker of these two loudspeakers in the current uh, sound field, which means that the level that we see over here at one meter distance determines the top of the skill. It determines full skill. Notice that on axis, to our UPJ, which is a less powerful loudspeaker, we see one color division difference. In other words, our UPJ is three decibels less powerful than our UPA. And that is the reason that all things being equal, that our UPJ, which is three decibels less potent, does not get to throw, for lack of a better description, does not get you throw the same distance as a UPA. And I'm going to hope, I'm going to make an attempt at making you appreciate that better by doing the following thing. Notice that this color meets that color on the right hand side. This color transition meets that color on the right hand side. This color transition meets that color transition on the right hand side. This color transition meets that color transition on the right hand side 
and I can keep doing this all day long. No matter where I look, the progression on the left is always three decibels in the lead with respect to the progression on the right. Everywhere I look, I see a one color division offset. This color lives over here, this color lives over there, this color lives over there, this color lives over there because the UPJ is 3 dB less powerful than the UPA. And that means that means that come 28 meters, which for whatever reason is today's goal, come 28 meters, which is over here, my UPA has the desired level, regardless of what that level is, but it has the desired level, whereas my UPJ reaches that desired level already after 20 meters, and therefore is 8 meters shy of making it to the same distance that the UPA can travel to meet its, uh, to meet its desired level. And I can prove this very easily in the following fashion. I can prove this very easily, this concept, by doing the following. Okay, let me hide the annotation, let me clear the prediction, and let's take our UPJ loudspeaker and physically move it forward, push it forward by 8 meters. Now it lives 8 meters ahead of the UPA, and let's do another prediction. Notice suddenly that after 28 meters, after 28 meters, which was our destination, after 28 meters, suddenly both UPA and UPJ meet the same level at that distance. In order to make that happen, we had to move the loudspeaker 8 meters closer. Alternative you can move your audience 8 meters closer towards the loudspeaker. Whether you bring Moses to the mountain or the mountain to Moses, that is a matter of preference. But here you see that in order to match the power of these two loudspeakers, to match the power at a given point in space, we need to account for the difference in distance. And here you see a first example of how to put that um, to practice. Okay, we're going to look at more of these predictions within the keynote. So let's go back to the keynote and look at that very same example. Because here we see a section of that table that we saw before. If our UPA happens to be the main speaker today for whatever reason, then a UPJ1P is three decibels less powerful. Whereas a UP junior is six decibels less powerful and the UPM is anywhere from 9 to 12 decibels less powerful. And the only way that we can make them equally powerful is to adjust for the distance that these loudspeakers have to travel to their respective destination. So here you see exactly the same exercise as that we saw in map before. On the left hand side we have our UPA 1P which achieves a certain desired level at 21 at sorry at 28 meters but our UPJ 1P that is 3 decibels less powerful already achieves that same level after 20 meters and therefore is 8 meters short of meeting the same level at 28 meters and the only way we can do that because it's 3 decibels shy of the same level that the UPA reaches at 28 meters distance the only way that we can fix this in this case okay either bring the audience closer or move the loudspeakers three decibels closer to its destination because that loudspeaker which is three decibels less powerful reaches the same level after 20 meters where the UPA that is three decibels more powerful reaches that level first after 28 meters so now which is ultimately what it's all about. Now, come 28 meters, like we saw before, come 28 meters, those loudspeakers are able to deliver the same level. So how does that work when we do not compare a UPA to a UPJ, but compare a UPA to a UP Junior? Well, the UP Junior is another 3 dB step down 
in power, if you will. And that means that where our UPA gets to travel 28 meters, the UP Junior only gets to travel half of that because six decibels less power cuts your distance in half. A 50% reduction is a 6 dB loss. And that means that that same level by the UP Junior is already reached after only 14 meters. And that means that now I'm 14 meters short of meeting my target distance of 28 meters. What can we do? We can move the audience towards the loudspeaker, or in this case, we're going to move the loudspeaker towards the audience. And by pushing that loudspeaker two times closer to its destination, we, uh, we account for the level loss over distance. And now both main PA and fill loudspeaker reach the same level come 28 meters. Let's do it again. And this time looks at a UPM. UPM is another three decibels down in level with respect to a UPA. And that means that the level that a UPA reaches after 28 meters by UPM is already reached after seven meters. And it's 21 meters short of providing the same level at 28 meters. What are our options? Move the audience towards the loudspeaker or move the loudspeaker towards the audience. And by bringing that loudspeaker four times closer, we gain 12 decibels to account for the fact that this loudspeaker is 12 decibels less powerful. And there you see the relationship between distance and level. So with that in the back of our mind, let's now start looking at this situation, which we saw earlier. We have a Leo main element, which throws 70 meters. It's clear that we need an outfill for the people living over here that look in Ed Sheeran's ears. But that distance where the outfill becomes sole custodian is only 40 meters, which means that those people are almost two times closer, not yet, but almost two times closer. And that means that I can get away with a loudspeaker that is almost two times less powerful. So if we really go look at the, the fine detail, then we're looking at a ratio of 70 meters over 40 meters, which is roughly 1.75 to 1, which tells me that the people in the sole custody of that outfill are five decibels closer to those loudspeakers than the people living in the back of the arena. And now that I know how this range ratio translates into a level offset, I can consult my chart and come to the conclusion that if I were to use a lion element a Lion M to be more specific, which is the narrower of the two, that if I use a Lion M element for that particular duty, for that job description, that that is perfectly fine because as long as we have a loudspeaker that is within five decibels with respect to the main PA, it's not softer by five decibels or more, that loudspeaker will be perfectly capable for that particular duty. So Lion M would be a perfectly acceptable solution. Uh, what are other options do we have? What if I want to explore the option, will the Lion W suffice for that job description? Well, the Lion W is within one dB, right? We need a loudspeaker that is preferably down in level by five decibels. The line is roughly down by six decibels. That's within one dB. One dB is the just noticeable step that most mere mortals will hear in intensity. So that's within one dB of the perfect candidate, and that would be still a perfectly acceptable solution. It has one advantage, which is that the line W is the wider of the line elements, and that means that I get to cover more of that area um, next to the stage and maybe save myself a other outfill loudspeaker, save myself another outfill system to cover those extreme outer seats by choosing a W uh, rather than a line M. However, what if Leo is my main element and I consider using Leopard? Well, I need a loudspeaker that is within five decibels with respect to that main PA. But the Leopard, as we can see over here, the Leopard lives over here in my table, and which means that the Leopard is down by nine decibels with respect to the main element, which is Leo, and that means that the leopard is not powerful to provide the desired pressure come 40 meters. So the leopard for such an application would not be 
a viable solution. Whereas the line M or the line W has, uh, is a perfectly acceptable solution. So there you see a first experiment, a uh, uh, first uh, application of range ratios and power scaling. Now maybe, you know, I'm working in the same venue, but rather than using a Leo element as main, today I might have a Lion M as main element. Okay, so now it's not a Leo that has to throw 70 meters, 70. Now it is a Lion that has to throw 70 meters. I still need an outfill. But the people in the custody of the outfill are almost two times closer. What are now my options? Is the leopard now a viable option? And the answer is yes. Because with respect to the lion, the leopard is only down by six decibels. And now, unlike before, that leopard is a perfectly acceptable solution within 1 dB again, which is good enough, within 1 dB, that leopard is now a perfect companion loudspeaker to that lion may element. Whereas in the previous scenario, it wasn't. So it's all about range ratios, time and again. And the same is true for front fill applications. Imagine that today we have a leopard main PA. This is a section view. You're looking at the venue from the side that we have a leopard um, main PA. And somewhere around the first row, we want the main PA to meet the front fills. And that means that whatever level we have at the base of that main PA, where you're staring into that bottom waveguide, that level we would like to sustain until, you know, we're past the first row. From the first row to where the bottom loudspeaker and the array touches down, we would preferably like to sustain our level. Well, on access to that bottom element, it's four meters to that particular loudspeaker, which is the bottom one of the array, whereas on access to the front fill is only one meter, which means that if I were to use a leopard element as front fill, then I have a loudspeaker that is four times overpowered, that is 12 dB too powerful. There's no justification or very little justification to use a leopard for that job description. I can get away with a loudspeaker that is four times less powerful because I have a four to one range ratio. So I should be looking in my table, I should be looking for a loudspeaker that is 12 decibels down from my main element. And a UPM 1P would be a perfect justifiable solution under those conditions. So the UPM would be the ideal companion loudspeaker for that Leopard system. Let's look at another instance. What if uh, we end up using Leopard main PA once more, but this time it is eight meters to the start of coverage with respect to that Leopard array. And for all we know, it is two meters from the edge of the stage to the first row. Again, for those that are paying attention, again, you might notice that we have a four to one range ratio. So also at this scale, the UPM would still be a perfectly viable solution because we're looking at a four to one range ratio, just like before, except that everything is two times more distant, but that doesn't change the relative ratio. So again, UPM would be the perfect companion loudspeaker in such a scenario. Let's look at another instance. Again, leopard array, eight meters to the point where the leopard touches down in the audience plane. However, this time the first row is at a distance of three meters to the edge of the stage. And now I have a different range ratio. If we look at this uh, more in depth, then we have a range ratio of roughly three to one, which tells me that I need to have a fill loudspeaker, a companion loudspeaker that is no longer 12 decibels down from my main element, but this time only nine decibels down from my main element. And that tells me that the UP Junior or an X20, Ultra X20, would be the ideal companion loudspeaker on this skill in this particular situation. Okay, let's look at another example. Maybe we have a Lena array. And from the bottom element to the first row with respect to the Lena array is eight meters. Whereas from the front fill to the first row is three meters. That is again the same range ratio. That is the same range ratio of roughly three to one. But 
This time I'm not using a leopard, which means that if I use a Lena, which is less powerful than a leopard, then nine decibels down with respect to that Lena, it no longer requires a UP junior, but requires a UPM1P. So now we're back in a scenario where the UPM1P would be the ideal companion loudspeaker, even though it's the same range ratio. So here you see the importance of having a good understanding of what are the big guns, what is my main element, because my main element will determine, using range ratios, the ideal companion loudspeaker based uh, on the setting, on the, um, on, the, on the situation that you run into on that particular day or that particular venue. So the UPM would be the guy that you want to look for. So here we have Mina, okay? Looks the same cosmetically to Lina, but uh, Lina is a superior loudspeaker in every regard. Mina was its predecessor. So now we have a Mina array, again, eight meters to where the Mina array touches down, three meters from the front fill to where it touches down in the first row. Again, a three to one range ratio, which means that whatever front fill I come up with, I can afford for it to be down in level nine decibels with respect to my MENA element. So I consult the table and I move over to the right and again I find that the UPM1P would be the ideal companion loudspeaker um, for that particular application because the UPM1P occupies those two boxes that live uh, next to each other. Okay. Um, so there you see the application of power scaling and I can do this for under balconies, I can do this for over balconies, I can do this for center fills. But that is the idea behind uh, finding the ideal companion loudspeaker based on, entirely based on range ratios. And that allows you to find the companion loudspeaker for every fill application because the majority of your audience has already been taken care of. Um, and that concludes uh, today's webinar. That is power scaling. That is how we choose the appropriate elements uh, for a particular job description, which means that I'm uh, happy to answer uh, a little bit more questions in a while. But uh, before we do that, uh, please allow me to remind you that a recording of today's webinar can be found on our YouTube channel, Meyer Sounds Thinking Sound. Um, which is uh, enjoying over 11,000 views as far as the webinars are concerned. Um, so there you will find the recording. I would also like you uh, to inform you that the next on-demand session where you get to choose is going to be in two weeks from now. And since power scaling has already been discussed, we've replaced that slot by a Montreux Jazz Festival. Um, you can make your vote known through the Meyer Sound user community Facebook group, which means that after this session is concluded, I will, uh, I will create a new poll, which has these three options for you to choose from. And then in two weeks, depending on your vote, we're gonna, dis we're gonna uh, discuss any of these uh, three options two weeks from now. Next week is a week that is dedicated entirely to Intelligent DC. Um, which are uh, loudspeakers with external power supplies. Um, very versatile, very interesting. I'm very much looking forward to it. Uh, we're going to see very cool uh, case studies. I've already seen a sneak peek. We're going to see very cool case studies of Intelligent DC. And that means as far as today is concerned, uh, I would like to express my gratitude for joining us. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to choose a different uh, camera. And I'm more than happy to uh, answer uh, some of your uh, questions regarding uh, power scaling. So by all means, um, by all means, um, please ask your question, raise your hand and make use of the chat box so that I can uh, answer your questions to the best of my ability. For the front fill application, we can use a more powerful loudspeaker than the suggested one, provided that we lower the level of the front fill by the amount that suits the range ratios. Right, right. Of course, I can use a Leo element uh, as front fill, uh, which is probably overpowered um, for that application. And there's nothing that keeps me uh, from turning it down. Um, but <laughs> that is a very luxurious position. I mean, uh, 
most sound systems tend to go as loud as we can afford. So if you have Leo elements lying around to use as front fills, uh, and I think that that is uh, uh, very uh, luxurious. Um, so of course that works, but power scaling is, is, is finding the ideal companion loudspeaker without going for a solution that is overpowered or underpowered for its particular job description that day. Okay, um, any other questions that I can help you with at this point? Okay, well, um, from what I can tell, nobody is raising their hand. Um, and that means that the chat is cooling down, in which case, uh, once again, thank you for attending today's webinar. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, best to you and your loved ones. And uh, hope to see you next Monday where we're going to talk about compass, control pages, and control groups. And uh, I already started working on that. And that's going to be exciting stuff because that's going to be stuff uh, such as the uh, things that um, you can see over here. Okay, so this is the stuff that we're going to discuss. Um, this is the stuff that we're going to discuss next, uh, next week very much uh, looking forward to that. So next week on Monday we're gonna talk about uh, compass control groups and pages. Okie dokie, stay safe, stay healthy and um, see you next week. Bye-bye.